Okay, so we'll get started again. Welcome back, everyone. Our next speaker is Russ Parsons. Russ Parsons is a research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service, Rocky Mountain Research Station, Fire Sciences Lab in Missoula, Montana. Russ's research examines fuels and fire as complex entities in three dimensions, employing state-of-the-art modeling and sophisticated mapping approaches, enabling examination of fuel and fire interactions in space and time. His work seeks to facilitate restoring ecosystems and protecting communities through wise application of fire, backed by the most robust science possible. Let's get the presenter I'll transition to Russ. Hello, folks. Uh, are you seeing my PowerPoint? Oh, yeah, I see it now. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm really excited about where we're headed with 3D fuels and fire and how these developments can improve many aspects of how we manage fuels and fire. Um, before I begin here though, I just wanna acknowledge that I work with some amazing people and the stuff that you're seeing here today for me has involved a lot of work from a lot of folks. Among the many partners listed here, I wanna just acknowledge Rod Lynn at Los Alamos National Lab, who along with Scott Goodrick at the Southern Research Station and others, developed the fast running quick fire model that you'll see later. This is really a, a game changing development. So um, we're used to the fuel models used by the 1972 Rothermel model. And for simplicity, that model assumes that fuels are homogeneous and discontinuous. But what we find is that, of course, real fuels are often heterogeneous and discontinuous. Um, and this, this abstraction that we have in fuel modeling makes it difficult often to relate fuel models to real world fuels. Um, and this is, makes it consequently difficult to represent fuel changes from fuel treatments or uh, changes in fuels that arise from disturbances. So, what we end up happening is that the, you know, the complexity and heterogeneity and discontinuity that you see in the real world fuels kind of just basically get squished down and homogenized for the model's purposes, but it, it's at a loss of detail. So um, we face a really growing set of challenges in fire management. We know that we need to shift from pure suppression to more proactive management, such as prescribed fire and fuel treatments but we need new tools to carry those out well. So uh, probably the central idea of what I'm talking about today is that going 3D will help us get there, strengthening our ability to assess if we will meet our objectives. Um, and as you know, many times our, obje our objectives are, are complicated, so we need to be able to evaluate things on multiple levels. So uh, the, there's a number of developments that we've seen over the years that really have made this possible. We've certainly seen uh, advances in computing with you know, cloud computing, live data, mobile stuff. That's all really had a huge impact. Um, similarly, this development of new 3D fire models, of which there are several, really opens up new capabilities for looking at fire in more detail. Um, and my work has been primarily in the development of fuel modeling systems that deliver data to these models and analysis using them. So I'm, I'm gonna be talking about two fuel modeling systems, stand fire and fast fuels. Um, and I'll talk more about those. And then finally, um, I'm gonna be talking about how going 3D uh, opens up new opportunities for us in terms of communication, um, expanding what we can do in training, and opening up a whole new realm of possibilities and how we you know, go over incidents that have happened that we wanna look at, uh, walkthroughs, briefings, engaging with the public, um, and particularly just being able to communicate and, and, vis and visualize things with uh, more detail than we've been able to before. So um, you may or may not have heard much about these physics-based uh, 3D fire models. Um, they're often portrayed as kind of untested, new, newfangled stuff. But in fact, they've been in use and in development in the wildland fire science world for over 20 years. And the uh, underlying math behind the computational fluid dynamics or CFD basis that makes them work actually dates back to 1822, making that math actually almost 200 years old. Um, so this is actually pretty established science. Um, as an example, in the old days, uh, Boeing would build scale models of airplanes and test them in wind tunnels to evaluate the stress on the wings. 
But now they de design them in computers and they test this wing stresses in computers and simulation models. So um, anyway, this, so the, the idea is that this is fairly uh, established science. It's used widely in all sorts of engineering fields and it's just uh, its application of fire that we're, we're thinking of as new. So the fire bit, the physics-based fire models give us an opportunity to look at fire behavior in just a lot more detail and um, they just offer a lot of possibilities. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more about what those do. So um, one of the things that's been a central topic of my career so far has been what I call the fuels to models problem. So we have pretty good methods for measuring trees and aspects of fuels in the field and lab. And we have models like FVS that deal with full tree list detail, capturing species and structural diversity within forest stands, for example. But when we take that data and we go into a fire model like we do in the fire and fuels extension of FBS or FFE, there's this huge bottlenecking of the data. Um, so in order to get to the, our operational models, we just lose all that detail. So that isn't necessarily a huge problem if all you wanna do is suppression, but as you get into these more proactive methods or, or approaches that require looking at within stand heterogeneity and actually talking about real fuels, uh, you quickly fall out of detail. Uh, so really what we've been trying to do is address that, that situation. So uh, the last few years we've been working on this system called Standfire, which uh, basically seeks to get past that bottleneck. Um, so Standfire basically uh, enables you to take tree list level detail, uh, typically through FVS ready data, and put it out into a realistic 3D model and then connect that to uh, 3D fire models. Um, and currently, Standfire is set up to connect to two of the uh, bigger 3D fire models, FireTech, which was developed by, Los, by Rod Lynn at Los Alamos National Lab and uh, uh, Wildland Urban Interface Fire Dynamics Simulator, or uh, WFDS, uh, developed at the NIST lab and by uh, Ruddy Mel in the PNW Forest Service Lab. So here's just a little bit about this system. Um, oh yeah, an additional part of what Stanford does is post-processing of simu simulation output, providing metrics for analysis and support of fuel treatment uh, analysis. So um, I don't have time to get into this in great detail, but here's just kind of a quick view of like the interface that we have right now. So basically here, uh, you're selecting uh, your your FVS keyword file that's that's connecting to the FVS model, um, and then within that you're picking a particular year that from your FVS simulation. So you could simulate fuels over time with FVS, and any one of those points in time can be used in a detailed 3D fire simulation. So then you're specifying the the area that you want to that you want to look at. Typically, we go with a couple acres at, at a time uh, to look at stand level stuff. Then we have this interface here for dealing with surface fuels, so you can build them on the fly from stuff that you've measured or, or estimated, um, and those fuels are translated into the 3D and made immediately available to the the 3D fire model. Then here you're specifying something about the geometry of the and timing of the igniter file. And then we have uh, another thing down here for doing some example treatments of uh, th crown space thinnings and a few other things. But anyway, here's here's an example uh, simulation with, with Standfire. So this is using the 3D fire model WFDS. Um, and what you'll see here is a untreated stand and then three treated versions of that with different levels of uh, crown space spatially explicit thinning. And the important thing to understand is that the fire simulation is dealing with the with the fuels at a one meter 3D resolution. So any uh, heterogeneity it encounters within that, it, it takes into account. Uh, there's also uh, the, the there's the fire is simulated with interactions between the fire and the atmosphere, and um, you can have fire to fire interactions as well, which which are an important part of these models. So here's what those kind of simulations look like. Um, so you can see that in the untreated case, we get a lot of uh, canopy fuel consumption, whereas the 
all three of the treated cases actually drop the fire down to the ground. Um, now, one of the important things about this capability is they could assess that same setup with a, with a different fuel treatment or with different conditions. So one of the things we do with Sandfire is this post-processing of all that complicated output. So we summarize the data within this kind of area of interest, which is a one acre parcel, and then we let the fire burn into it so we get uh, you know, legitimate fire behavior. Um, so what we do is we summarize from the individual tree level burn data, uh, which includes fuel consumption and other metrics over time. We summarize that up to this one acre area and we can, we can aggregate metrics that capture the overall what happened. So this is showing what happened for the untreated case. And we get all sorts of metrics on the, on the heat transfer and everything else. Um, and then of particular interest for restoration purposes, we can, we can take that data and each tree within that area that we're analyzing gets put through the fire effects probability of mortality model. And we get spatially explicit uh, predictions of tree mortality. Uh, and so here's the treated case and here's the untreated case. So what this provides is a capability for um, assessing uh, you know, resilience. Will, will the treatment that we did, will it result in the stand being ready to survive the next fire that comes through, that kind of thing. Um, so um, anyway, what we um, what we realized is that stand fire, we just wrote the paper on that and it came out in 2018, so it's still kind of new. And it does make a big leap by giving managers a way to do more in-depth analysis on fuel treatments for a stand. But to really affect the changes we want in fire management in general, we need to make it possible for people to work on their specific projects and landscapes. Um, so toward this goal, we've been working on a new platform called Fast Fuels. So what Fast Fuels does is it basically leverages the tree map layer that Karen Riley and others developed, um, which basically links FIA plot data IDs to uh, pixels on the landscape, okay? Then we took our stand fire uh, logic and we reconfigured it to wrap around that and make it possible to create uh, landscape scale data that leverages the tree map layer, but enables us to do 3D data for just about anywhere. So um, the basic idea that we're trying to do here is get past this, uh, this fundamental scale difference that we have between plot level data, where we can go out and measure a few trees, and landscape level data that we need for all of our large scale applications. So um, basically fast fuels is handling this fuels to model problem by providing good default data. Um, and then particularly it provides a way to incorporate more local better data like LIDAR um, to, to update and make your local data better. So essentially we, we have what I think of as good models in these physics based models. Um, and, um, but largely we've had the problem that we didn't really have fuels that could get into them very easily. So fast fuels is basically giving us okay fuels that go to good models as well as pathways to get better fuels into good models. Um, so here's an example uh, animation of some fast fuels data. Um, and basically what you see is uh, the different colors represent different species. And you can see there's, structural variability within the stand that is driven by the underlying FIA data uh, plots um, that shows you know differences in species and structure and all that um, and we have a, an elaborate structure that enables us to keep track of all this stuff and to model it in 3D and the, the, the primary goal is to make data that will run with these big fire models. Um, so another thing that we can do with that is that uh, you know, basically these 3D data sets are like raster data sets on steroids. So for those of you who work with spatial data, you kind of know that rasters are really efficient for, you know, all sorts of purposes. So similarly, these, these data enable us to pipe external influences through them. So we could have, for example, a spatial time series representing uh, fuel moisture or other gradients that could play directly into the fuels at, at the individual voxel level. Um, and some of that is ongoing, but Matt Jolly is developing a system for live fuel moisture and other things that is that is spatially explicit and gridded. So we're getting there. These are going to connect soon. 
Similarly, uh, one of the strengths of our system is that it uh, continues to retain the, the tree IDs and the fundamental uh, forestry data that the fuels are derived from, which means that we can go in and we can simulate a, uh, a disturbance, in this case, a mountain pine beetle attack, um, and we can similarly we could we could deal with uh, uh, silvicultural level detail fuel treatments by manipulating the lists of trees based on their species and diameter and things like that. So it, it gives us connection and a level of detail and control that we've never had before. So here's an example of our our fast fuels data going into a 3D fire model. In this case, Quick Fire, which was developed by Rod Lynn at Los Alamos National Lab. What you're seeing is four animations of the same burn, okay? Here's showing the fuels as they're being consumed. This is energy to the atmosphere, which is an important coupling mechanism. This is the showing the moisture loss as the fire grows, and this is the, the winds and the plume. So importantly, Quickfire is just one of several of these models. Um, there's uh, the 3D fire models, started with FireTech and FDS and WFDS, which are very big, very powerful models. But more recently, there's faster versions such as QuickFire and the FDS level set and some other models like Wharf S-Fire that bring whole different capabilities and there's more on the way. So one of the uh, important applications of these models is that they give you, uh, you know, they, put, they deal with the process of smoke getting up into the atmosphere. And because they, they explicitly deal with transport, you can see where the smoke's going to go, and you can also do some very elaborate stuff looking at where the embers will go. So these provide a whole other level of detail for those kind of applications, and they can feed right into the coarser scale plume transport models that uh, Peter Lamb was talking about. So another important application of these models is in their ability to communicate complex concepts that are difficult to otherwise describe. So in this case, we're showing a, a relatively shallow topographic feature, and these streamlines indicate that, that the wind is being channeled by the topography. But what you see when we have a fire simulation is that as the fire enters the scene, you're going to see these, uh, these convective vortices start, uh, counter-rotating vortices as they're often described, um, and the, the the heat from the fire is stronger than the ambient wind. So it's dominating the wind flow and this rotating you're seeing. This is all an emergent property of this physics-based modeling. So this really shows, illustrates the capability of these models to get under the hood and show us how fires operate, which, which is really informative for when we want to mess around with fuels. What do we expect to happen when we do that? Um, so let me move on. Okay, now I'm going to just give you a really quick tour here. Um, so this is about the communication aspect. So um, over the last few years, I've been working with Matt Gibson at the Northern Rockies Training Center uh, to bring these new technologies into the world of training and to assist in ops as well. But Matt has been working on this for longer than that. So here's a tour of some of the stuff he's been doing, okay, with uh, 3D and also virtual reality. Here's Matt appearing as a 3D avatar, okay? His hands in place move, okay? Um, here he's using a, a drip torch tool in his hand to zap and make fires on. Uh, this is a uh, 3D uh, 360 degree photospheres for hazard tree identification. So real world sake, it's a real world hazard tree situa situation and it's a training system that enables people to make decisions about what hazard level is and what we do about it. Um, so um, I'm going to keep going. Now you'll see uh, more 3D uh, scenarios where, for training where you can spawn objects, uh, detail objects, and you can move them around to make a custom scenario. Um, in this case the application is for saw training. And you can walk around the tree, you can assess the, the scene and decide, you know, what's your strategy for how you're going to do this. And with the 3D handsets, you can take that, um, that chart and figure out what's your strategy. How are you going to deal with this tree? So you grab that chainsaw, bring it up, look at what you're seeing. So you're, in, your, in your views, you're seeing this right in your hand. 
Um, now, uh, what's illustrates is an ability to bring in an immersive aspect to training that we haven't been able to do. And now, uh, what you're seeing now is a little bit of Matt's efforts to uh, show how these things can be used to in, in simulations can be used to make this more realistic. Again, uh, enhancing the immersive experience. Here's another example where of, of a, he's looking at for how to do the cut. We're starting to, you know, weight some of the wood, and then as gravity and and other physics uh, aspects would uh, come bear on this, you'd start to see them collapse. This is a 3D uh, kind of briefing on, on the division. Um, in this case, uh, you're seeing the landscape, and as he zooms in, you'll see there's him and there's other people in the scene. In this situation, uh, you can actually walk up to each other and talk to each other virtually. So it's the, the sound is spatial. You can also, as you can see, you can put up maps or video and you can play back things in 3D to help make more immersive. Here's some example of fantastic uh, simulation modeling that uh, 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 one of our partners worked on in developing this. This is Samantha Orient. Uh, um, and now here we're showing um, uh, some, some bringing the 3D data into the VR world. So on the left, you see that terrain, and on the right, uh, some output from the 3D model where you're seeing smoke move. Um, and uh, I think that might be approaching the end of this demonstration for, for Matt. Yeah, so Matt Gibson put that all together, and Samantha Oriet Orient at the Payette, Payette Dispatch Center did those amazing animations. So here's, I, I'm just gonna keep going, I got a couple more slides. Uh, so this is another example of how these 3D models can add value to what we're doing. In this case, we did calculations that incorporate both the radiative and convective heat transfer. And you can see that this, this object here is from both the overhead and uh, uh, oblique perspective, it's changing color as its exposure to those radiative and convective heat uh, fluxes uh, gets more serious. So this has huge impl implications for identifying exposure and wildfire risk, and it's able to be calculated in a 3D dynamic environment with these models. Okay. Um, okay, so in conclusion, um, obviously we know that fire and fuels are 3D. That's how we experience them in the real world. Uh, so as we go to 3D in our modeling capabilities, it enhances our ability to actually carry out real world projects, particularly projects that involve higher level detail like prescribed burns where the interactions between fire lines in our ignitions have a huge impact on the outcomes. Um, and a fuel treatment analysis where the within stand heterogeneity is totally critical to the outcome. Um, the, these 3D fire models bring the capability to deal with interactions between all the different components and particularly fire to fire interactions which are so much so important to how actual fires burn. And then the, the visualization capabilities that we get from these new things just expand a whole realm of, of training. Um, you can imagine that we could have all sorts of aspects. Uh, this is particularly important in this realm of where we are now, where like, virtual training is becoming more and more important. Um, so, and then as far as our plans go, Fast Fuels is currently being planned for several demonstration areas focused on real world projects, um, fuel treatments and prescribed fires. Um, Stand Fire will be integrated into Fast Fuels and will be expanded considerably. Um, and the prototyping 3D training is ongoing and Matt Gibson and Samantha Orion have been critical to that effort. So that's it for me. I, uh, I think uh, I might've gone over a minute or two, but hopefully I'm all right. Very good. Thank you so much, Russ. 